avoiding the pitfalls of ad tech's growing scale. With us today is Mike Nolet, CTO and uh, founder, co-founder of AppNexus, and Andrew Lenahan, solutions engineer. Um, at the conclusion of the presentation, we are going to have time for questions and answers, so you can enter questions into the webinar tool. You can enter this any time during the presentation or during the Q&A session. Uh, with that, I'm going to pass it over to Mike to begin. Good afternoon, everybody, or good morning if you're on the West Coast. So this is Mike here. I'm really excited to talk to you today about some of the pitfalls of ad technology and building ad technology that I've seen over the last eight and a half years, um, building ad tech and working with companies in the space. There's feedback here. Done. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, so uh, first of all, I think, you know, before we start, I think we all know this, but I think it's worth calling out that programmatic buying is a reality. It's, it's the reason we're on the phone here today, and there's, there's just this continued growing trend. Um, but I think the most interesting thing to call out here, we've all seen this graph, is actually um, the growth in RTB indirect and premium sales, and the percentage that that's expected to make up of the global or the U.S. advertising market. Obviously, this trend is happening globally in Europe and Asia as well. And the impact of this is very significant. Most specifically is that RTB in itself, or programmatic buying and selling, is a disruptive technology trend. And it's requiring everyone to adopt and uh, implement new technologies that can do RTV, that can do programmatic reserve, that can bid on inventory, that can enable real-time bid streams, that can work with behavioral data, which we're now opening up as an opportunity. And what we're seeing is globally around the world, everyone is looking for the new technology. Right? And every day I talk to companies and partners who say, hey, I want to do programmatic buying. I want to do programmatic selling. What technology should I use? What technology should I buy? What should I license? And today, that's the general topic we're going to talk about. And specifically, there's three pitfalls that I've seen over the past couple of years. One, a lot of companies underestimate scale. Two, people um, don't are, are unrealistic about their own success and then thus aren't intellectually honest about what they're actually doing. And the third is actually not thinking about true value, right, or the opportunity cost of what you're not doing because of the decisions you're making. So let's just dive right in. So the first one, and, and if you've heard me speak, you, you've definitely heard me talk about scale before. It's a message up next that talks about a lot. Um, and it's a message that's actually really just fundamentally prevalent in the online advertising space. It's become really commonplace for companies to cite QPS statistics, how many ads per second, how many terabytes or petabytes of data. Um, and the reason this keeps coming back is because the ability to scale is a competitive advantage for any advertising technology company. Through and through, what we've always seen is a trend where ad tech companies launch, they start building, they hit scale, and then they stop innovating, right? And so the ability for companies to scale and innovate is huge, and inevitably, every single CTO, unless they've been through the pain before, ends up underestimating that cost. Now, if you look at this slide here, uh, I presented this actually about two years ago at one of our first uh, AppNexus summits to talk a little bit about why innovation is hard. Um, and this is half of the equation, right? Scaling, so there's three sides that make innovation difficult. First is an increasing rise in volume of impressions, right? And the, the higher the volume you're trying to deal, the more time it takes to engineer solutions against that. So if you're doing something once a day, it's very easy to build technology that does that. If you're doing it a million times a day, it becomes harder. And now, of course, we do things 42 billion times a day. You can imagine that gets very difficult. The second thing is that doing things with more people is harder than with fewer. If I'm doing something alone, I don't have to communicate with anybody. I can just do what I want, right? And if I change my mind, I can just do whatever I change my mind towards. If I have a team of five, I have to get the entire team on the new page. And if you have a team of 50 or 100, that becomes harder and harder. So as teams grow, it becomes harder and harder to develop as well. And people underestimate the people scale required and the complexities around that. Um, and at UpNexus, we spend a lot of time thinking about organizational design and getting the right people leaders in place just to be able to innovate. And the last thing is the more customers you have, the more features you need, right? the more features you have, 
And the more time you need to spend making sure that the new changes you're implementing don't go back and break previous functionality you've built. If I'm building a brand new product with no customers, I don't worry about things breaking. If I've got 150 product customers, and I've got over a billion dollars worth of media flowing something, I really need to think about the cost of change, right? And as that cost increases, so does the amount of time it takes to actually implement that change. And the sum of those three really results in this exponential curve, where uh, that cost of scaling a, a full technology stack, right, that is, has adoption, that works at scale, that has a full size team, becomes incredibly difficult. And because at the beginning of that curve, it's actually quite easy, people inevitably underestimate. But this is actually only half the problem, right? So this is the problem that many people say, well, I know this, I've heard this, you've talked about this before, but, you know, but this is nothing new. The other piece that I've uh, noticed recently as I talk to companies, and as we talk about what their scaling points are and where they're struggling, is actually because the entire ecosystem actually got more complicated. And the old world was, you know, you had a seller who had DFP or ad tech, a publisher ad server, and you had a buyer, and the buyer had his own ad server. It could be an ad network with a proprietary ad server, or it could be an agency using DFA or Atlas or MediaMind. Um, but that world has changed dramatically. We now have sellers who are actually directly integrated with buyers, and there's technology services like Dynamic Creative that overlay and data providers. And so now when you build ad tech, you no longer just have to worry about building your technology. You can't, it's no longer just you build a publisher ad server. You're now building a piece of technology that has to integrate with many different companies. For example, we have over 150 different bidders through which we've done technical integration, and each of them requires time. It requires testing time, and we're working across company boundaries, right? So this is where it's often, uh, often companies go and say, hey, your a API is broken, can you fix it? And it requires kind of collaboration across companies to figure out where issues are and how to resolve them. And so this complexity of the ad tech ecosystem makes that scale problem even harder. So not only are we talking about more volume, we're talking about needing a full size team and actually building something with real customers with real money on the line. We're also talking about having to integrate that entire stack across many different companies. So this is one of the, the key pitfall here is that people underestimate this and that they don't staff appropriately against all of these challenges. If you're building a real-time cell site system, you need to staff up a bidder support team, and you need multiple full-time people working on how to actually support those bidders and realize that it'll take months to actually get the integration flow. Similarly, if you're doing a, a bidder system, you have to integrate with all the different exchanges. You have to debug those. You have to keep up with other people's standards changing because you're no longer fully uh, in control on your own. So one of the key strategies to counteract this pitfall is to understand, manage, and predict, and manage, and, 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 for, and basically put strategies in place against um, this pitfall, and make sure that you minimize complexity when you don't need it. Right? Make sure that you minimize features when you don't need it, and find ways to address that. And we'll talk about this more as we go into the next two pitfalls. The second big pitfall um, might seem counterintuitive Right, so how, how can you misperceive your own success? Um, and we, we, we talked a bit about this a little bit at our last summit. Brian O'Kelly actually showed this graph. Um, it's very similar. This is a, a sample business, right? And, and many of you on the phone may have a business that has this level of growth where you're talking about doing 100 million or 150 or maybe it's 100,000, 150. But this level of growth where you're seeing that 50% or growing by 50,000 uh, every single year uh, or million, sorry. But the reality is you have to compare your own growth rate against that of the overall industry, right? So if you're growing 50% last year, 33% this year, 25% next year, 20% next year, the, the, the fact is you're growing slower than the industry. And what that actually means is that your market share is declining. And I can't tell you how many pitches I've heard from companies or how many times I've gotten diligence calls from VCs where they talk about these companies, that are say, they say, hey, it's actually tremendous growth. Because from a financial perspective, you look at this, you say, wow, this company is exploding, it's doing great. But in reality, it's losing market share. And losing market share is dangerous because that means you're losing influence, which means you need to take a hard look at what you're doing because it means your competitors are actually doing something better than you are. Right? So what happens is companies, because they keep growing, they, they, they stop being intellectually honest with themselves and saying, hey, is what I'm doing truly differentiated? Right? Am I winning? Right? Or am I really being competitive in the market? 
And so I urge you not only to plan for scale and think about scale, but also to be really honest about your own growth rate. Now, this is kind of a hypothetical graph, right? But you know, these are some of these industry growth rates is what we've seen with RTV, right? So um, really, and there's various benchmarks you can find out there. You'll have to do the one that's right for your market. You know, if you're in Europe, you want to look at European markets. Some of them are growing faster than others today. Um, but be careful and be honest about your own company's performance and make sure that you are truly being differentiated and competitive in the market. Uh, because it's easy to forget that other people might be growing faster. And of course, as the industry growth slows down, what's going to start happening is that decrease in market share is going to start showing itself in your P&L as a decrease in revenue. So as long as the pie keeps growing for everyone, it might seem great for everyone. But once that pie stops growing so much, you want to make sure that you can protect your slice of that pie and potentially keep growing it. And that depends on, obviously, the technology decisions you make and, of course, the strategic decisions as well. But it's really the third pitfall that I want to talk about the most. And the first two are really more to, to lead up into this. And that's thinking about opportunity cost. Right? And I think every company needs to think about um, not only the cost of doing things. That's of course pitfall number one, the scale. Be intellectually honest about what they're doing and how differentiated that is. But also think about what they could be doing. And, and the reason I say this is because I just see countless, countless companies out there that are going out there and rebuilding what, in all honesty, is commodity. Right? So for example, one thing I hear over and over and saying is people saying, I'm going to build a bidder. And people go and they'll spend a year going to build a basic bidder that does some CPM bidding, some cookie matching with exchanges, and some basic reporting back to their clients. Well, guess what? If you spent the last year doing this, there's a company that just released an open source bidder. right? That's pretty much the definition of its commodity, right? And it's probably not a good investment of your engineering time if people are saying it's no longer strategic intellectual property and I'm going to open source it. In fact, AppNexus, we actually open sourced a bidder four years ago. No one was using it, so we kind of pulled it off because we, we stopped supporting it. But really, this fundamental basis is actually not very differentiated. You're not adding a ton of value. And there's so many platforms out there today that out of the box, you can get better functionality than you could build in one year. Um, and that's dangerous. And that's why I say that we have to think about the opportunity cost. Right? Investing a year, or it's probably more like five man years if you hire a team of five to go build this, investing man years of engineering time into building a bidder when other people can just license something out of the box working with partners like AppNexus or Turner or companies like this. Right? I, you need to think about that opportunity cost and the incremental value you could have driven if you'd found a way to work on top of or in partnership with uh, other technology partners who already provide this base this platform. Uh, one of the things we're really excited about here at AppNexus is our kind of API strategy. It's in our API everywhere kind of philosophy and thesis where we think what, what we aim to do is to open up every aspect of our technology stack so that others can build on top of this. So in our example here, we provide infrastructure, reporting, ad serving, optimization, yield management. And these are all tools that our clients are building cool technologies on top of, like their own custom landing page optimization, dynamic creative services, forecasting of available inventory. And all of this, by the way, I, mean, you know, we've talking, I was talking about fitters, but this works in the most sell and buy side. Right? Arguably, I think everyone would agree, it doesn't make sense to rebuild DFP. Right? Why would you rebuild a publisher ad server? You know, you're much better off taking a yield X strategy and building an independent forecasting technology that leverages DFB, right, rather than rebuilding from scratch. And that is exactly the same when it comes to programmatic buying. And you should also think about the integration of third parties, right? So you don't have to actually build everything or get everything in one place, right? You, there's, there's a baseline platform you, of course, need, but you also can work with key differentiated partners on some of those pieces. You know, contextual technology is one of my favorite examples as I think it's one of those pieces of technology that no one should be investing in today uh, because there's already 10 companies out there fighting tooth and nail to differentiate themselves with the best contextual technology that have been investing in this for years. Um, you don't want to compete with Grapeshot when it comes to keyword specific you know, language, uh, multilingual contextual technology. They've spent years on this. You're much better off licensing it from them. And if, of course, they ask for a too high price, you can go to their closest competitor. Um, and you can get the majority of the value by licensing a technology rather than um, just trying to build everything yourself. So 
So I think that's kind of number one message here in this pitfall of looking at the opportunity cost. Think of what you could have built if you weren't reinventing everything from scratch. And the simplest example I have here is you know, internally here at AppNex is we make we have this conversation um, daily. Every every time we build new technologies, our team looks at buy versus build. And there's situations when it's really, really obvious. You know, we are not going to build a transactional database. There are MySQL, uh, Microsoft SQL Server, Oracle. There's so many open source and commercial solutions out there that have solved this underlying technical problem that we choose to use MySQL and companies, things like Vertica and Netiza as our databases instead of investing many, many years of time trying to build our own database. Could we build it in a slightly more custom fashion that might be better for us? Sure. But the key question is, what else could we have done in that time? What is the value? What is the opportunity cost? Engineers love building things, love making things better, but you have to always ask an engineer, what's the value you're driving? And what else could we be doing instead of this? Right? And that's the question that is very hard to ask and critical. Same with things like Hadoop. We use Hadoop. It's fantastic open source technology. It has its limitations. It's a pain in the ass. It's hard to get working, but it doesn't make sense for us to build from scratch. We'd rather extend Hadoop to work the way we need it to work rather than trying to reinvent the wheel. And these technologies that have helped us get to market with more higher value, right, bidding solutions and optimization technologies rather than focusing on bits and bytes, things that are actually pretty commodities. Now, the number one objection I get to this, so I believe I'm being my own critic, um, the number one objection I get from people is saying, look, I need to own the optimization. Optimization is my secret sauce, right? And I bet some of you on the phone, this resonates. Optimization is my secret sauce. I need to go to market and I need to have my position in the market be clear that I have data scientists and algorithms and that I can do real-time bidding better than that. Now, one aspect of this is the marketing aspect. I'll, I'll talk to that in a little bit. Um, and various marketing to me is a problem that can always be solved by better marketing. Um, in that I think people are talking a little bit too much about the bid and not necessarily as much about the real value. And sometimes we forget why we're here, right? But we're here to show relevant advertising to, rel to users who are interested in those advertisements so that they respond to them and buy things, right? Or that they have higher brand association. That's why we're actually fundamentally like here. We're not here to bid, right? That's our fundamental goal. But arguably, you know, a lot of people will say, but I still need on the algorithm. And one of the challenges today is that people feel like they have to build a bidder so that they can actually own the algorithm. Or they need to build their own SSP sell set system so they can own the yield optimization for sellers. And it's a valid concern. Right? In reality, we have an optimization system that works in a certain way. Um, but again, I think the important thing is to talk about actual value. And the model I'd use for this is one of diminishing returns. Um, and the idea is here, the more you invest in something, the lower the return is. Right? So building, uh, well, we'll talk about bidders in a minute, but if I build a, a simple model, it's going to get me actually a pretty high return over someone doing it manually. Adding some data science will have you a pretty significant return. And then continually tweaking and tuning that, the more you invest, the less your return on investment is going to be. And, and I'd love to pass it here to Andy. Andy actually did some research on this here at AppNexus. Um, and he has a great uh, case study actually looking at Netflix, um, who has invested a ton of time and a ton of money in optimization. Uh, so, so Andy, why don't you talk to us a bit about Netflix and the Netflix Primes? Sure. So thank you, Mike. And it's a pleasure to be speaking with everyone today. Um, so yeah, on the topic of algorithms, um, we dug up this, this pretty smart case study on the Netflix Prize. And for those of you that are, that are unfamiliar with the Netflix Prize, in 2006, uh, Netflix announced a competition uh, called the Netflix Prize, which aimed to improve their movie recommendation system by opening it up to development by the public. That competition was judged on the accuracy of the new system's movie rating predictions. So that would be against the user's actual rating. The measurement that they used to judge that accuracy was called uh, root mean squared error, or RMSE. Any team that improved on Netflix's RMSE by 10% would be awarded $1 million. So by 2007, over 20,000 teams had registered for the competition from over 150 countries. After a year and over 13,000 submissions, 
Uh, scientists from at and Labs formed a team called Corbell that improved on Netflix's RMSC by 8.4%. So their solution involved a combination of 107 different algorithms and over 200,000 or 2,000 hours of, of total work. The next year, the at and Labs researchers joined forces with consultants from a company called Commendo and improved on the 2007 solution by a single percentage point in one year. By 2009, leaders from a number of different teams collaborated on a solution that surpassed that 10% that improvement benchmark over Netflix and earned them the $1 million prize. Hold on one second, please. So, as you can see from this graph here, the teams hit a point of diminishing returns where after the same uh, investment of time, they started to achieve lower and lower returns from that investment. And after it was all said and done, Netflix did not even utilize that, that new solution. As they said, the accuracy gain didn't justify the, the engineering effort that it would take to implement those winning algorithms. And by 2009, kind of the focus of their business had shifted a bit into uh, streaming video, which has a much different kind of uh, recommendation psychology and made the Netflix prize efforts almost obsolete. So what if they had shifted their focus a bit earlier? Uh, for example, what if they had built out a tool that improved their recommendation engine by adding social data? This would have provided huge incremental value for them without them necessarily having to refine the, the fundamental elements of their product. And this becomes especially evident when we put the Netflix prize in the context of the overall product development. The accuracy of the algorithm had likely hit a point of, of diminishing, turns well before, diminishing returns well before they had even conceived of, of the contest. Had they layered on a new technology such as social data earlier, they might have captured uh, much greater returns in the long run. And in fact, they actually did end up layering in that additional technology in 2012. So being that very few people in the audience likely care about movie recommendation systems, I'm going to pass it back to Mike to explain why these same principles apply to ad technology. Thanks. So I, I love this example, right? Because it's, it's really, it's a perfect example with optimization technologies, how you really can invest I mean, hundreds of thousands of hours at a time, right, for, in the grand scheme, the 10% improvement, right, which over a five-year period really is relatively immaterial when it comes to Netflix. And, and I think the world of, of RTB or real-time buying when it comes to, I'm going to apply this to a bidder, and I think the logic is very similar, right? The return metric, I mean, it depends. Is it ROI? Is it something else? But, you know, you could spend a year and you could build a decent system that would get you, you know, a relatively good amount of return. You can work on that for another year and another year, right? And each additional year of investment will see you less and less return on that system. And I think if you look at our optimization, we've probably seen a similar kind of uh, behavior with, with our optimization, where, and fundamentally, our optimization towards click and performance, post-view, post-click. But Remember, the pitfall we're talking about here was looking at the opportunity cost, right? The reality is you could spend three years and kind of countless man years of engineering time and optimization and data science time on trying to build this, but there's also a certain algorithm that you can get out of the box today, right? And what you have to think about of that, what is that, that investment of time where you're rebuilding a lot of quantity technology um, to get to that incremental revenue, what is the opportunity cost? Right? right, and in fact, by the way, don't forget, three years from now, our system will be in a different place, right, and, and other technologies will be out there. You might invest the next three years uh, trying to beat technologies that are out there today, but those technologies are going to change, right? They're going to get better. They're going to actually improve. And instead, what if you started focusing on new ways of engaging with the user? So, for example, dynamic creative one of the many different things you could do here that would change the overall picture. And with not that much investment, you could dramatically improve on a commodity optimization system because guess what? If you can double the response rate on your ad, you know, that bid price is now twice as effective. So instead of getting a 10 or 20% improvement, you're talking about a 100% improvement, 
And we have seen a lot of statistics that doing dynamic creative will give you 50 or 60 percent lift. Right? And the thing is, there are so many different opportunities here to differentiate yourself that would actually drive truly incremental value. Right? We can talk about landing page optimization. Imagine if you have a dynamic creative, right, and then a dynamic landing page. And what if you layered on some third-party data to truly customize that experience based on the income of the actual user? So you show the relevant product in the ad. You're selling cars. Wealthy user, you show the high and luxury car. Not wealthy user, you show a more kind of uh, eco-friendly, low gas consumption car. You then go to the landing page. You customize the landing page experience based on the user. You do optimization on the actual landing page as well to ensure that you know, the, the conversion rate increases as you go through. Right? Now, imagine what that does. Let me, let me just go back to the curve. Right? If you keep layering on all these technologies, the effectiveness, the return on that bid price will be dramatically higher. And so when we talk about pitfall, right, it's really critical to think about not just what you need to build to differentiate yourselves, but what you could be building if you weren't focused on what you're focused on today. And there absolutely is incremental value to building your bidder. I am sure, and let me go back to this chart, I am sure that this is true, that people could go out there and beat our algorithm, and companies have. But think about how much time and money it would cost, right? And instead, let's think about what's really going to be innovative in the coming years. Uh, and that's a really important question to ask everybody. And what we're seeing on FX is really, really exciting to me. Um, here's just a couple of examples. Um, I've, uh, one, uh, Actually, the first one I'm most excited about, um, and so we'll lead with the most exciting first. Um, one, one, one really valid criticism of this whole optimization algorithm is, hey, that's great, except you guys optimize inventory to creative and advertiser, and you don't think enough about the user beyond just frequency. And that's true, up until now. Um, we'll announce this officially later, but I guess since there's over 100 of you on the phone, I guess this is a technical pre-announcement. But one of the things uh, we, we're working on right now, and actually testing in production with a very limited set of clients, is for our clients to be able to push user-level bid modifiers into our stack. So instead of having to build the bidder from scratch, you can start with the value, the optimization algorithm that does different pricing based on a user. Let me give you a real tangible example. Let's say you're an e-commerce merchant, and you have a loyal customer. And that customer has a certain purchasing habit. But there's also profitability against that customer. You've got products where you're pricing them at, you know, almost at, with almost no margin because your competitors do. And then you have differentiated products where you have a much higher margin. You could model out your audience and find the users that drive profit and pay far more for those users by increasing this bid modifier up or even setting an absolute price and then pay less for the unprofitable customer. So instead of just simple remarketing, you start doing intelligent remarketing and really driving users back based on their activity and behavior on site. And of course, imagine layering on independent data. Um, there's so many exciting opportunities about this. And this is really going back to our commitment as a platform for enabling innovation, um, really listening to our customers and understanding that, yes, you can build. There's so much opportunity for innovation. And we need to make sure we extend everything we do towards that. Um, and so the first example here is specific as that. We now let our clients, and we'll make this publicly available shortly, bid differently on a per user basis. And again, that is so that, one, you ha can avoid some of the scale challenges right, uh, that goes on. Two, so you can build truly differentiated technology and actually make sure that you get ahead of that growth curve in the industry. And three, so that you don't kind of focus too much of your time building technologies that, you know, in the end, aren't going to be differentiated. Um, three other examples here. Um, we have a client connected, really cool. They basically created a marketplace around a new ad format. Uh, they built this around the platform. They created the ad format for out evangelizing, selling, um, and they, they didn't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, we have companies that have built analytics platforms on top of the platform. Really cool stuff, looking at heat maps and really helping our helping uh, buyers and sellers truly understand what's driving revenue and what's actually driving results. Um, and forecasting solutions. We have companies that can forecast across all real-time supply, across real-time demand. Um, and of course, many of these are becoming available, not just, uh, many of these companies are using these technologies, not just for their own media budgets or their own inventory, but also making them available for sale to other partners on the platform. 
And uh, there's, there's two case studies in particular that we thought would be great to talk about. Um, and, and Andy, I'm going to pass it back to Andy. Um, I think he's going to talk first a little bit about Volkswagen, who was working with a client of ours. And then he has a second case study to talk about, too. Yeah, so to discuss a little bit uh, more deeply a few instances of these technologies being built on top of the platform and producing real results for our clients. Um, first off, we have, as Mike mentioned, the, the Volkswagen example, where uh, Volkswagen works with a company called Blue Mango, which is uh, a Dutch online marketing company that was um, approached with an interesting opportunity to improve performance on Volkswagen retargeting campaigns. In particular, they wanted to increase test drives at local dealerships. So rather than rebuilding a bidding engine from scratch, Flex One, which is kind of the technology arm of, of Blue Mango, built a suite of technologies on top of AppNexus console. They developed a, a pixel management solution called FlexPixel that allowed them to segment users in a much less manual way based on the vehicle models that those users were interested in. They also developed a dynamic ad serving solution called Flex Ad that allowed Volkswagen to customize elements of the creative based on models that users had previously expressed an interest in. So these different technologies actually yielded uh, very significant uh, improvements in performance. So over a 60% increase in campaign performance over the, the static ad units that they had used previously in their remarketing campaigns. Additionally, they saw a decrease in cost. So the inclusion of this um, tag management system that kind of automated the segmentation of all the users across uh, Volkswagen properties allowed them to decrease their operational costs by about 20%. And then the, the second case study that we've included here is uh, with ING, Mindshare, and BannerConnect. Um, so ING and Mindshare uh, work with BannerConnect to develop a targeting solution that would incorporate relevant environmental data. So they built a, a data provider called Converge, which when integrated with the AppNexus bidder, has the ability to target users in real time based on local weather conditions, for example. So they'd be seeing different creatives based on elements of their local environment uh, that would resonate a bit more with that, with that individual user. So from the conception of this idea to the launch of the product, this application took about two weeks to build um, and contributed to a 28% increase in performance over the control group that they had that was not seeing um, environmentally based ads from their, their application. This same type of technology could potentially incorporate any number of, of other factors from uh, stock exchange to television programs being on. And these are a few, just two of the kind of deeper examples of impactful investments AppNexus partners have made in developing uh, incremental value on top of the platform. And my colleagues and I would really enjoy helping anyone out there in, in webinar land uh, brainstorm and create their own, their own unique addition to, to the stack. So with that said, I will toss it back to Mike for some closing remarks. So these are just two great examples. Um, there's many, many more, right? We have, uh, we have companies that are um, building dynamic yield management, yield optimization, and plugging in dynamic floor prices. We have just, just so many different examples of companies doing really great differentiated things. And I think what's really nice is about those partnerships is that these are companies that only build for scale when they need to, that are really differentiating, that are looking at their growth rates and ensuring that they're growing and differentiating themselves uh, with real value added technology. They're adding incremental value. Um, and they're, strike, they're, they're, they're really building the baseline for their business to increase their share of the larger pie. Um, and so I recommend all of you think about that, think about kind of what scale problems you need to handle and which you don't, um, which technology you can work with, which you can't, um, and, and really think about where your business is going to go over the coming years. And of course, we'd love to help you get there. So we're here um, with all the pieces, and there's some problems we can solve and some we can't. And if we can, we would be delighted to work with you to actually solve them. So I think that's all I have for this. So I, let's turn it over towards questions. 
Okay, so if you guys have any questions, just go ahead and feel free to put them into the question uh, box on the webinar system. Uh, we have a few that's kind of come in so far. Um, so the first question is, you know, this is actually from Mike. Um, so what technologies do you think uh, kind of show the most promise for creating a big impact and value for customers? So I think if we think about value, um, the, there's, there's two big aspects that I think are obvious to me, which is first, we haven't figured out the brand experience yet. Um, and no one's really figured out how to effectively get brand money onto programmatic. And it's clear there's an opportunity there. Um, if I knew the solution, we would have built it. Um, but I think there's a ton of opportunity to help brand buyers understand brand impact and results from uh, programmatic buying so they can ship more of their money there. Um, because we know that the operational overhead of existing premium is too high. And I think that's a huge area of innovation today. Um, and I think the second one is thinking about this fundamental problem about what is the right message to show to the right user at the right time. Um, and many, you know, if I, if I just browse the web and look at the ads that I see, um, so many of them are bad. I mean, it's just, I don't understand why I'm being targeted, why I'm getting this decision. Remarketing is simple, it's creepy, I see the same product. I think there's so much room for improvement for actually showing better advertising to better users. Um, and I think there's a ton of opportunity for innovation there. That ranges from better dynamic creatives, that ranges to figuring out how to actually effectively integrate third-party data. It means bringing real valuable third-party data. It's just your site history, is just boring. I mean, there's some things you can learn from it, but it's much more interesting to know how much money you have as a consumer? What can you afford? What are you actually interested in buying? What are you in market for? So I think to me, the two, those are the two obvious areas that kind of come to mind kind of right off the top of my own. Okay, thank you. So um, the next question is, um, you know, there are a lot of sort of components in, in sort of available platforms today. Is the assumption that sort of anything, any one of those components, you know, example given reporting, are, are not really sources for differentiation, or are there still opportunities to, to kind of get value in those areas? Well, it's a good question. I think uh, uh, reporting in itself, there's degrees, right? So on a scale of 1 to 10, you know, you can build a very simple system that just shows you how many impressions you bought yesterday or how many impressions you sold yesterday in revenue. And building that reporting system is not differentiated in any shape or form. Um, and then there's the 10, where you can answer any possible question and predict which questions you want to ask, right? And provide that as kind of live streaming real-time analytics in the face of the customer, right? I haven't seen a 10. I don't think it exists yet. Um, commodity is probably somewhere at a, a 5 or a 6, right, and growing. And But at some point, it's never going to get to that 10, right? Because Every niche is different. Every market is different. So there's, there's actually, I think, a ton of opportunity, especially in the analytics space, um, to provide value. People don't understand what's happening with their campaigns. They don't understand what they're buying, why they're buying, when they're buying. And so there's, I, I'm seeing a lot of companies doing some really innovative things. Now, you know, commodity platforms will get better at this, of course. So I think the key is to think about long-term differentiation, too. Or how is this a stepping stone into a deeper relationship with the client base, right? Just providing a simple dashboard of daily operating results, you know, is that going to be differentiated three years from now? Probably not, right? Real-time streaming bid uh, landscape information with pricing suggestions, probably. Um, so I definitely think there's a lot of opportunity there. Um, but just be careful to, to, again, be intellectually honest with yourselves about kind of is it differentiated, and how fast is that revenue stream growing? Because fundamentally, revenue is probably what will show you the most. If your technology is taking off like hotcakes, you know you've stumbled onto something that people want and need. If you're selling it and you're growing, but not that fast, maybe you need to revisit it. And so we have time for one last question. Um, and this is sort of related to that point. Um, you know, when you are sort of selecting that new technology, um, is there any type of rule of thumb for sort of identifying maybe where on that sort of point of diminishing return curve uh, that technology is currently at? I think the only thing that tells, well, I think I go back to understanding value, right? Um, one, one misperception that I think a lot of companies have is they, they, 
they think about um, uh, exit strategy before they think about value. Right? So some companies are building technology for the sake of building technology because they've raised VC money. And so I'd say just flip it upside down and say, think about what value you're trying to drive. Do an evaluation of the technologies that are out there. So if you're thinking about buy or build on analytics, call up every single company that's out there today. Call up Aggregate Knowledge. Call up Meta Markets. Call up Yieldex. Get demos of their technology and understand if that's something you want to license or if that's something you want to actually build. And I think the best way to do it is to actually go see for yourself, kind of poke the tires on some of these technologies um, and make your own evaluation. Uh, so, and then I think you'll see also by asking questions around roadmaps and growth, right? Hearing these companies talk about what are they going to be doing in the next 12 months. If there's really not much that sounds really cool and exciting, you're probably kind of further along that curve. If they're saying, well, this whole thing is still going to change, you know, that you probably got some big leaps. And kind of to go back to the example of optimization, I just told you we're doing some deep fundamental changes to our optimization system to enable user-based bidding. You know, you can imagine that because I'm making this announcement now, we're moving that point further along that curve, and I think it's still a pretty, pretty significant way, right? Um, now, the next step is obviously going to be lower. We already optimized inventory and user and all the advertiser data, right? So what's next is not going to have as significant an impact. Um, so think about that. Roadmap, kind of poking the tires on some of these technologies, understanding where they're going to be, comparing, kind of understanding estimates from your team on how long it would take to build some of these things, um, and that'll help you make that judgment. Okay. Um, I want to thank everyone for uh, attending today's webinar. Um, again, we'll receive a follow-up, and uh, this will be posted as a recording available later on our website. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Have a great day.